Let's go. Limitless Mike and I am back with one more video today. I'm gonna be breaking down the hundred and two hundred at the Prefontaine Classic because I know these two events. Let me let me be more specific. I'm gonna be breaking down the men's hundred and two hundred at the Prefontaine Classic. I do think that these events um, are gonna get glossed over at the Prefontaine because there were so much great running, great track and field events. So for some reason, I just feel like the we we had some great performances and they're not gonna get enough shine um, as they would maybe in some other circumstances. So let's get into it and let's start with the men's hundred. So in the men's hundred. We had, of course, we had some of the top guys in the world. Uh, we did have the silver medalist at the Olympics, Fred Curley. We had the bronze medalist, Andre de Grasse. We had Ronnie Baker. We had Trayvon Brumel, who did not make it to the Olympic 100 meter dash final, um, but was one of the world leaders at one point in time. Michael Norman dropped down from 400 to running this. Justin Gatlin was back after pulling up at the Olympic trials, as well as America's anchor um, at the 4x1. Cravon Gillespie was in this, uh, and Isaiah Young, and Akani Simbine. So, our top time. We did have a wind-aided 100-meter dash. It was a little windy with a 2.9 tailwind. But still, Andre de Grasse took the, the 100, and he ran a 9.74. Fred Curley was in second with a 9.78. Ronnie Baker was in third with a 9.82. Trayvon Brumel was fourth with a 9.86. And then Michael Norman comes in fifth with a 9.90. Now, whew, first off, Andre de Grasse got his lick back. He was like, Fred, you got me at the Olympics, but you will not get me today in this one run. Now, it was so close, but he did end up getting him at the line. A uh, 974, that's a great time. That's, that's a really good time. Once again, it was wind-aided, but if it wasn't wind-aided, I do believe that this would be the fastest time in the world if it wasn't for the wind. Uh, once again, if if it wasn't wind dated, this would be a, a seasonal bet. Uh, this would actually be a personal best for most of the men in this. It would be a personal best for Fred Curley and Ronnie Baker. It's not going to be because it's wind dated. Brumel came up after some kind of disappointing running. Um, he did say that his legs felt a little funny or like his leg was a little tight at the Olympics. He does come up to run a 986. So on another day, this a 986 windy or not kind of wins this thing, uh, you know, and even prior to this race, uh, Brumel was beating a lot of these guys, which is which is ironic and kind of, I know, frustrating for him. But it's also it's dope. It's bad and it's dope, I guess is what I'm trying to say. To go from at the beginning of a season, you're beating these guys, you're beating uh Fred Curley, you're beating Andre DeGrasse. I watched it. I did a video to to Trayvon Brumel beating Andre DeGrasse pretty handily. Um, but for now, after the Olympics, DeGrasse is back and killing it. Fred Curley is also killing it with that 978. I have to keep saying it's wind dated because it is wind dated. But I think this race is going to give these guys a lot of confidence. Like, I feel like for Fred Curley and especially for Ronnie Baker, and I know these gentlemen already have confidence, but I think once you start getting into that, ooh, I ran a 9.7. Ooh, I got a, I got a, a personal best, 9.82. Like, I think that's going to help uh, these guys' confidence build. Um, and that's going to make – that makes me ask this question, like, what is going to be next 
for Fred. What's going to be next for Andre DeGrasse and for Fred Curley? Andre DeGrasse is now stepping into it where he's competed for a while. Um, he was kind of he, – he competed with Bolt a lot. And the fact that Bolt was there made it so that he couldn't get the golds. You know, he got a lot of silvers and bronze. And now he just got his first Olympic gold. Um, he's done it like he's done he's done it all. He's an extremely successful sprinter. But do will he be able to withstand it? Like, will he be able to keep going um, and just continue to, to gather in those wins as – Fred Curley develops as Ronnie Baker develops as Christian Coleman comes back as Noah Lyles, you know, gets everything kind of together himself. Like what will happen for Andre DeGrasse? I do hope that he continues to run at a high level and, um, you know, just win and compete. I just hope he stays in it. But at the same time, I could also see not necessarily him, but someone in his situation um, kind of falling off after struggling to get to the top, after putting in so much work to get to the top. Like, I can at the same time imagine him kind of being like, whew, well, I did it, I'm done, um, you know, maybe letting some of the success go to him. So I want to know what you guys think about that. Do you think Andre DeGrasse will continue? I definitely hope so. Uh, but at the same time, I could see – how it could happen for how people fall off. Like when the success finally hits after a while, you know, sometimes it can be a downhill. Now also what's going to be next for Fred Curley. He is the silver medalist at the Olympics. He is a 400 meter, um, you know, world-class guy. He is an all around sprinter. He has a, the hundred speed, the four strength. So logically I would have to say that the two, might be best suited for his like six two six three frame, um, but what's what's next for Fred? He's he has more meets. Like we still have a lot left in the Diamond League. At least we have uh, five more track meets where he can definitely compete as long as he wants to. Um, but I want to know what you got. What do you guys think's next for Fred? What should he do? Is there an event that suits him best? He's shown he's the, one of the best in the world at the 400, and he's clearly one of the best in the world at the 100. Uh, he could develop in either of those races still. He's still a young guy, um, but what do you think he should do? And also, is Gatlin still going to run? Gatlin in this one, he had a 993. Um, he ended up getting sixth place. He's about 40 years old. Uh, and that is just amazing for anyone to be competing at 39, 40 years old, and he's still doing it at such a high level. Um, but will he be able to continue? Is 993 good enough? Like, he's a Justin Gatlin's a legend in the sport. He's a hero of the sport. But what will be next for him? Should he continue to compete? And then also, it sucks. Uh, the guy was the anchor of the the 400 meters, or not the 400. He was the anchor for the 4x1 at the Olympics for the Team USA. Uh, he didn't have a great leg on his USA anchor performance. And now we had him back here at the 100, and he did end up getting last. It's Cravon Gillespie. I guess what's, what's good? What's next for him? Um, he, he had some like response videos or he's a YouTuber as well. So he watches track. He's a part of track. So we did have kind of a response video to the overall performance. And then he comes out here and he doesn't have another good showing. So that's kind of ironic or funny. Um, I do think something's off with his stride or his running. Like he's just not competing at the same level that he was prior to, well, in prior years, I guess, like it just when I was watching him at the Olympics, it just seems like he was like stomping down the track or he didn't have great form. Um, but he did come in this race and get last. So what's next for him? That's a wrap for the men's hundred. I am going to move on to the men's 200. At their start this time around, everybody quite even as they come out of the box. Right, Benjamin out well with 200, but there's also one more. Well. He's outside. Oh, wow.
we had a great men's 200 race. Well, at least two guys, one to two guys in this had a great race. And let me just start off by saying this. Noah Lyles ran a world lead 1952. It is a legal win. And boy, that was amazing. It's going to get glossed over. Like, people aren't going to pay attention to it because there was so much going on at the Prefontaine Classic. Uh, there were so many great performances. But this is one of the top performances that was at the Prefontaine Classic. Now, once again, we have a 1952 from Noah Lyles. If you look at the all-time 200-meter times, that is going to be the fifth fastest time of all time. And it's funny because Noah Lyles also has the fourth fastest time of all time. So Noah Lyles is really doing it. He came back after... Uh, probably for him, I would say a disappointing Olympics. Um, he did get third behind uh, Andre de Grasse and Kenny Benderick, I believe. Let me check before I just make something up. Yep. So he did get the bronze behind <coughs> Andre de Grasse and Kenny Benderick, um, but he did come back to get that dub. He really got his lick back. Um, because in this race, he ends up beating Kenny. Uh, and Kenny had a great performance himself with a 1980. And then Noah Lyles' brother, Joseph Fess, um, also had a great performance. He had a 20.03 for a personal best. He's right on that 20-second uh, mark. Like, he's, he's about to get into the, the 19s. So, that's great, you know. A, two, a 20 in the 200 is is great like a, a low 20 in the 200 in my opinion you're world class you're one of those guys but of course you're not gonna win a lot of high level meets like at the top of the top you're not gonna win them um but you are very fast now josephus is getting into that like ooh, i'm fast and i might be able to to really do something here and get those medals if he continues to progress um but let me go back Noah Lyles, world lead, number five all time, number five all time performances. And he really, he had like almost a perfect race. Um, sometimes when I watch Noah Lyles and some of these guys, they're not always as well off the corner. Like they'll be a little back on the corner, but they'll just dominate that straight away. And this one was not like this. This one was one where Noah went out. In my opinion, he led the whole way. He ate the stagger on the guys outside of him. Um, Kenny was going with them. But in that last, like, you know, 40, 30 meters, he really just dove down, bit down, um, and accelerated and pulled away. And once again, a 980 is no slouch. But Noah Lyles was able to make a, well, not a 980, a 1980 is, is no slouch. But Noah Lyles was able to make it just look like, look, you know, make everybody else just look not well or that they're not in the same field as him. It was, it was kind of crazy. I was able to see it up close in person, and that boy was flying off the curb. So, whoo, I just had to really break that one down and let y'all know. Top five fastest 200 meter of all time. Coming in this weekend at the Prefontaine Classic. And once again, there is a lot more running to be done this season. And then from here, you know, next year we're going to have the World Championships in the USA at the University of Oregon as well. So, whew, we're, we got a lot of running over the next year and the next few years. Because there's, there's five more Diamond Leagues. We're going to see... A lot of just great events, and yeah, it's it, the future is great for track and field. This has been a great season, and we're going to see more events. But let me know, what was your favorite event at the Prefontaine Classic? Who's your favorite sprinter? And what, what's next for some of these guys? Like, what's, what's next for some of our great dominant sprinters? But it's your boy, Limitless Mike, Michael Coro, and I'm out till the next video. Have a blessed day. Be safe. Peace.